Welcome back to the CCB series of the Copyright Alliance's Copyright Academy. If you watched the other videos in this series, you already know that in these videos, the Copyright Alliance staff take an in-depth look into the processes and procedures of the Copyright Claims Board, or as we call the CCB for short. And the purpose of this is to help creators and others who are looking to understand more about the CCB, and hopefully these videos accomplish that. Now, hopefully you have already reviewed our educational materials on the CCB and perhaps watched our other Copyright Academy, Academy videos in the CCB series, especially the video on filing a claim with the CCB, as well as the video on notifying the respondent about a claim so that you are generally familiar with the start of the CCB process and the names of the parties. Now, if you haven't watched those videos yet, you may want to do that before watching this video. Today, we will be talking about the decision a respondent has once they're notified about a CCB claim that is made against them. Now, unlike claims brought in federal court, claims brought before the CCB are voluntary. What that means is that a respondent has the ability to opt out of a case. As a result, when notified about a case brought against them, the respondent must decide whether they want to participate in the CCB case or opt out of it. And there are numerous factors that a respondent will want to consider and that claimants should be aware of when making the decision. And so we'll discuss many of these today, as well as the technical aspects of making that decision and how one makes that decision and what they do. Now to talk about these issues we have with us today, uh, uh, Kevin Madigan, who is the Vice President of Legal Policy and Copyright Council at the Copyright Alliance. So welcome, Kevin. Thank you very much for joining us today to discuss this important uh, part of the CCB, or the Copyright Claims Board. And to kick things off, uh, I'm gonna ask you if you can tell viewers uh, what it means for a respondent to opt out. Right, thank you. So the short answer is really that respondents who have been served with a claim before the CCB have the choice to participate or opt out of the CCB proceeding. If the respondent opts out, the proceeding before the CCB ends, that's it. Uh, but if the respondent does not opt out, the proceeding will continue before the CCB. All right, so let's talk about that a little bit. The ability to opt out of a proceeding brought against a respondent seems like a unique feature, not just to me, but to many others. So for instance, if a person is sued in federal court or state court, they do not, repeat, do not have the ability to opt out. So why is the respondent given an opportunity to opt out of a CCB proceeding? It seems pretty unique. Yeah, so this opt-out provision was included in the CASE Act, uh, which is the legislation that established the Copyright Claims Board. And, and it was included to ensure that participation is voluntary and that the CCB does not run afoul of anyone's constitutional rights. Uh, and just by way of background, the Constitution guarantees a person's right to have a case heard by what's known as an Article III court. Now, Artic Article III courts are traditional federal circuit or district courts that include the right to a jury trial. Now, that's different than what's known as an Article I court, which is an administrative court like things like the Bankruptcy Court, the Court of Federal C Claims, and now the CCB, uh, none of which involve a jury. Now, even though a person has the right to uh, a jury trial, they can voluntarily waive it. Uh, and this waiver is accomplished in the CASE Act by giving respondents the opportunity to opt out of a CCB proceeding uh, if they wish not to waive their right to a jury trial. All right. So that's that's all very interesting. Hopefully that makes sense to, 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 to folks and viewers who are watching this and kind of understand and maybe questioning, well, wait a minute, why, why do they have to, why do they get the opportunity to opt out here? So the next question is one that we get quite a bit, is it because opting out may seem like an easy way for respondents to get off the hook and avoid infringement claims that are brought against them. But in reality, a respondent should not instinctively just opt out. There are actually several factors a respondent will want to consider when deciding whether to opt out of a CCB case or to participate in the case. Now, to help both respondents and claimants better understand the opt-out system, I think it'd be helpful if maybe you could discuss a little bit some of the factors a respondent should consider when making its decision 
whether to opt out of a case or to not opt out and instead to participate in the case. Right, yeah, so I'd say there are three main reasons that a respondent may want to participate in a CCB proceeding. And the first and really most important um, is that the respondent should consider the damages caps that apply to all CCB cases. So in a CCB proceeding, a claimant uh, cannot seek a total award of more than $30,000, no matter how many claims it asserts. Now that's different than federal court where there's no limit to the damages a plaintiff can seek. And so by not opting out, a respondent may be dramatically limiting their exposure to higher damages. Um, and while federal court is too expensive for many copyright owners, there will be many who can't afford federal court, but choose to bring their case uh, to the CCB first because of cost savings and efficiency. And so by opting out, a respondent is really putting themselves at risk of potentially much higher damages. Now, a second thing is the reduced expense of litig litigating a case at the CCB. Uh, the CCB process is simplified and therefore there's no need to hire an attorney. Uh, this is true for both claimants and respondents. So uh, when a case is litigated in federal court, really the, the largest cost associated with bringing or defending a copyright case is the cost of hiring an attorney. Uh, in fact, legal fees can often exceed the actual damages awarded uh, in a copyright infringement case. So giving parties the practical ability to defend themselves without paying an attorney encourages parties to participate. Um, and in addition to that, because all CCB hearings and conferences are virtual, there are no travel expenses. A uh, third factor is the expertise of the CCB officers. Um, so the CCB is a copyright specific tribunal that only hears claims related to copyright. Uh, so it has expertise in handling these, these, these disputes. Um, you know, if you go to federal court, your case would be decided by a judge who hears all sorts of cases and may have handled very few, if any, copyright cases, uh, or by a jury that's not familiar with the copyright issues. So the CCB officers and attorneys are copyright experts who have substantial experience in evaluating, uh, litigating, and adjudicating copyright claims, uh, representing both copyright owners and users of copyright protected works. So a party who believes that they have uh, a good defense against a copyright infringement claim, or even a viable counterclaim, may want to choose to participate in the CCB uh, because of the benefit of having those copyright experts decide a case. All right, so so you listed just the top three right there. I imagine there are more. I know I've heard more. So, and those sound like important considerations. So there are a few others that maybe you just want to mention uh, on this video here that, uh, that uh, our viewers might want to know about. Yeah, just to, to mention a few others quickly. Uh, one is the speed of the proceeding. So CC CCB cases are streamlined and will take much less time to resolve uh, than federal court cases, which can be you know, really beneficial to both sides of a dispute. Um, in the case of a respondent, you know, think about a scenario where the outcome of the litigation plays a significant role in a company's business operations. So for example, where resolving an infringement dispute is necessary before something like a product launch. launch, um, you know, A party may prefer the streamlined process afforded by the CCB so the business deal is not delayed. Another factor is that discovery in federal court cases can be very costly, time-consuming, and intrusive. Um, you know, on the other hand, discovery in the CCB is extremely limited and none of those concerns exist. Also, the fact that CCB hearings are all virtual, so parties will never be inconvenienced by having to travel or appear in person. And then finally, the fact that a respondent may have an insurance policy uh, that applies, and if so, the insurance company may require the respondent to participate in the CCB proceeding as opposed to taking that much bigger risk of being sued in federal court and being liable for a lot more money. All right. Well, thanks. That's that's very helpful. I think I think there's maybe some other considerations. Every situation is unique. So if you're a respondent, you may want to kind of think this through a little bit. Go to our FAQ page where we'll list uh, you know all the all the factors we could think of at least uh, and uh, things you might want to consider. So. Now, we've talked about the policy aspects. We've talked about these factors and considerations. Let's kind of move on now to discuss some more of the, more of the technical aspects of the opt-out process. 
So first off, can you explain how much time a respondent has to decide whether to opt out or not, and whether the CCB can grant an extension of time to respond? Sure. So when a respondent is served, they receive what's called an initial notice, uh, as well as a copy of the claim and the opt-out form. Now, after a respondent is successfully notified about the CCB claims against them, they have 60 days to decide whether to participate in or to opt out of the proceeding. Now, this is called the opt-out period. Uh, the CCB may, in exceptional circumstances, extend the opt-out period if it believes it would be fair and in the interests of the parties to do so. Um, now, one other thing to note regarding the opt-out period is that if respondents that respondents will also receive a second notice reminding them that they were served with a claim. Um, now, this second notice is sent by the CCB, not the claimant, and has no bearing on the 60-day opt-out period. It's the service of the initial notice sent by the claimant that starts the 60-day opt-out period. All right, thanks. And, and for those, if anyone has any questions or concerns about this second notice, we talked about that in prior videos, and you can see, get more information about it in our FAQs as well. So now you mentioned 60 days, right? 60 days is a long time, uh, at least in my view. Um, what should the respondent do during that opt-out period? And are there resources available to a respondent who wants to find out more information about the CCB during this period? Yeah, there absolutely are. So, you know, a respondent should really take the time to understand the CCB and the claims being brought against them. Um, and the first step in doing this is to review the three materials the respondent received when they were served process. Um, now, those materials I just mentioned, the first one is the initial notice. The second is the approved claim, along with any supplemental documents submitted along with the claim. And then the third is the, op the actual opt-out notification form. Um, you can learn more about all three of these documents by checking out our video on notifying a respondent. We talk uh, in detail about uh, these different documents. Um, also, if the respondent wants more information about the CCB, they can review uh, a very comprehensive handbook that the Copyright Office has put together, and it's available on ccb.gov. And that it really details each step of the CCB process, including an entire chapter on opting out. Um, addi additional information and resources um, can be found on the Copyright Alliance on our CCB Explained webpage, which is under the Education tab of copyrightalliance.org. All right, excellent. So, so let's assume that a respondent opts out of the CC, CCB process. In that case, what happens to the claimant's claim against the respondent? Right. So, so as I touched on before, if the respondent opts out, the case before the CCB ends. But opting out does not necessarily make the dispute disappear. The claimant may still bring the same claims in federal court which, as we talked about, could expose a respondent to much higher damages. So very important for respondents to remember and consider those things. Okay. And if a respondent decides to opt out, how, how would they go about doing that? Right. So it's pretty easy. The respondents can opt out online through a form available on the eCCB, which is the CCB's electronic filing and, and case management system. Uh, respondents can also use a paper form, but the CCB strongly recommends that respondents use the eCCB to really expedite the process. Um, one benefit of opting out using the online form is that it guarantees you, uh, you get back sort of like an e immediate email confirmation. Um, the CCB handbook provides simple instruct instructions for opting out online. On the eCCB homepage, there are you know, buttons displayed under the welcome to the ECCB header. Uh, and all you have to do is click on opt out of proceeding. Uh, and the opt out uh, of proceedings form page will appear. Um, you can also reach the form uh, from the home page by selecting opt out of proceedings from a set of buttons near the, the bottom. So they really make it easy to find on the ECCB website. Now, the opt-out form will ask you for some standard information, such as your email and your mailing address. Um, also, for security purposes, there are some specialized information required um, that's uh, unique to a CCB proceeding. 
That includes the uh, docket number of the case. There's also an opt-out key code, and then also the respondent's name. Um, and then respondents must also check a box stating that the respondent opting out will not appear in the proceeding and also certifying that they are authorized to submit the opt-out form. Um, now, as far as who is authorized to submit these forms, respondents, the named respondents can obviously opt out themselves, but they can also authorize a lawyer or other representative to submit it for them. Um, for example, if the respondent is a business, um, the opt-out form can be submitted by uh, a lawyer for the business, a business owner, business partner, an officer of the business, um, a member of the business, or really any employee who's, who is directed to file the form. Um, and then finally, uh, a law student uh, supervised by a law school clinic or a pro bono legal services organization can also be an authorized representative. All right, and see, we just talked a lot about how somebody would go about opting out if they wanted to, but we don't want to be ne negative Nellies here. And in fact, we think a lot of people will not opt out, especially when they when they consider the factors. So now let's take on the other scenario, one where the respondent doesn't want to opt out. In other words, they want to participate in the case. What should a respondent do if they want to participate in the case? Right, so if the respondent wants to participate, uh, no further action is needed during the opt out period. The proceeding will simply become active and move forward after the 60 day uh, opt out period expires. Um, after that 60 day period, the respondent will be notified by the CCB that the case is now active and will provide uh, further instructions for next steps after that. All right. So, so just to make sure there's no confusion here, to be absolutely clear, what happens if a respondent does not opt out during the opt out period? Right. So if a respondent does not opt out during the 60 day opt out period, the case will automatically become active and move forward. Uh, the CCB will issue a scheduling order and the respondent will uh, be prompted to file a response and any other counterclaims it might have. And this part of the process, uh, we're actually going to discuss in a forthcoming video on the procedures for an active case. All right. Perfect. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a good segue because we are going to have another video on uh, active cases and what to expect during an active case. Uh, but I, I want to thank you, Kevin, uh, for answering a lot of questions about the respondent's decision, whether to opt out or to participate. I suppose, I think we kind of covered it, but I, I suppose that there's a, there could be a viewer or viewers out there watching this video and, and, and they still have remaining questions. And so if you're out there, you watch this video, you still have questions about uh, about the decision-making process or the opt-out or participation process, uh, feel free to go to the Copyright Alliance's uh, CCB Explained page, uh, which is on our website under the Education tab, or you can call our CCB hotline uh, and uh, ask your question, and we'll do our best to try to respond quickly. Uh, the CCB hotline is 888-5403-CCB. Once again, that's 888-5403-CCB, and you can call that and ask your question to try to get more information. In addition to that, you can also check out the numerous resources the Copyright Office provides on its website at ccb.gov. And I think that pretty much covers it. So thank you all for watching this video, the, 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 the past videos we had as well, and keep an eye out for future videos about the CCB process. And have a great day.